Welcome to Tales from the Jails. And today, by special request, John G. Sutton, that's me, will be talking about Mad Frankie Fraser. And that was that ugly bastard we started off with. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I know about Frankie Fraser, and then I'll discuss my interactions with him uh, as we get further forward in this little Tales from the Jail section. Right, well, Frankie Fraser, Mad Frankie Fraser, was born in 1923 in London. He was uh, a deserter in World War II. He was called up for national service, and uh, despite all the rest of the men going to the front to fight the Nazis, uh, Frankie Fraser didn't do that, did he? Mad Frankie Fraser started breaking into people's houses. The men were away at, uh, in, in Germany and doing their duties. Not Frankie Fraser. He was breaking into their houses at night, went under the cover of darkness in the blackout, and helping, them so, helping himself to whatever he could get his hands on. And no doubt uh, selling it on the black market. Uh, <coughs> he was uh, taken into custody for um, absconding from the military, but that didn't seem to have any effect on him whatsoever. However, at the age of 18, in the year 1941, they finally got Frankie Fraser locked up for breaking and entering, smashing grabs. I mean, how despicable is that? I mean, people were hiding in the <coughs> underground sheltering from the bombs that were being dropped on London, whilst at the same time Frankie Fraser was entering their houses and robbing them. A despicable little rat, yeah? So following World War II, Frankie Fraser managed to get himself involved in uh, a step up from basically breaking and entering, he was doing something called smashing grabs. Part of his career pattern, eh? A little promotion, I know what I'll do. I'll go smashing the front of shops in and robbing their contents. He got two years uh, imprisonment and was sent to Pentonville, which is a London prison, uh, a Victorian London prison. He didn't manage to do two years, though. He was, whilst in Pentonville, certified insane. Hence he gets the title MAD. It's a soubriquet that throughout his life, Frankie Fraser would certainly earn. MAD. So he was taken from Pentonville to a place called Cane Hill uh, Mental Hospital, where he was uh, subdued, treated, didn't do any good, and he was finally released in 1949. Uh, when he got out, he joined various uh, small-time gangs in London, and uh, in another escalation of his uh, career, his chosen career as a, a lifetime criminal, crook, and scumbag, he set about doing a series of bank robberies for which he was duly imprisoned eventually when they caught up with him. So he was obviously a, a thief, a crook, a liar, a, th a bank robber, a smashing grabber, generally a petty little hoodlum and uh, he couldn't have been very successful at it because he getting locked up, you know. So not much of a Smart crook, was he, yeah? More of a plastic gangster. Anyway, he ended up in HMP Durham, and uh, he didn't manage to do his bird in HMP Durham. No. Nope. He ended up being certified insane and was sent to Broadmoor Prison, where he was heavily medicated by all accounts. I've seen the records, by the way. You wonder how I know this. I'll tell you. I was the records officer at Strangeways Prison in 1979-1980. And uh, into the prison came Mad Frankie Fraser's records. Everybody else had an A4 leaflet, you know, an A4 folder. Not Fran Mad Frankie Fraser. He had a cardboard box, a big 
cardboard box full from bottom to top with all his records, including details about how he'd been flogged. Uh, I mean, we're talking about being strapped to a, a triangular frame, have his shirt taken off his back, and the prison's physical training instructors, who in my experience, usually fairly muscular guys, you know, uh, they whipped him with a cat of nine tails. Seriously, and that didn't happen to Frankie Fraser once, it up to him twice. Plus he'd been on bread and water and all that stuff. All that was in his records, I read it through him, hence. I know, quite a bit about that thief, the low-life villain, uh, Mad Frankie Fraser. Anyway, following his treatment at Broadmoor, which had no effect, including the electro-convulsive therapy, that's where they strap you up to a machine and pump electricity through you. Yeah, didn't affect him. Came out completely as mad as a box of frogs, which is the way he remained. And he was out in 1955, where he then joined uh, up with a villain, a notorious East End gangster called Billy Hill. Now, I suggest, you know, if you're serious about wanting to know what East End gangsters are about in the 1950s, have a look up Billy Hill. Well, he was the enforcer. Mad Frankie Fraser was the enforcer for Billy Hill. And they had a disagreement with another infamous gangster called Jack Spot. And it was Mad Frankie Fraser that uh, attacked Jack Spot and his wife at the same time, by the way, just for good measure. Did them both. And... Uh, <coughs> He set about them, gave him a serious beating, various weapons, because don't forget Mad Frankie Fraser about five foot two. The way he works was not none of this, uh, I'll give you that. No, he couldn't do that. He got weapons, axes, knives, swords, you name it. Broken bottles, anything he could lay his hands on, guns, didn't matter. He got seven years for that. As I say, he wasn't particularly successful at this career, was he? Kept getting himself locked up. <clears throat> so, anyway, following his release from this brief interlude where he got locked up, he she must like it, eh? He was released and he joined a, a group of villains, notorious villains, uh, called the Richardson Gang. <clears throat> now, the Richardson Gang... We probably know about them. They were they set up a it was a slot machine scam, whereby they had slot machines set in pubs. But they were basically there to identify that the Richardson gang were their protection, and they were extorting money from them. And of course, anybody that didn't uh, pay their money to the Richardson gang, they sent in. <coughs> the notorious madman Frankie Fraser to attack them. One such uh, individual that received a severe beating was a man called Richard Hart. Yeah, another villain, but he'd managed to get on the wrong side of the Richardsons and therefore he was introduced to Mad Frankie, your personal torturer. Anyway, Frankie got five years for that, Mad Frankie. And then he came back and he was working again with the Richardson gang. But this time he was their chief enforcer. But obviously not being really <clears throat> physically equipped for the job. He had a team that worked with him. And it was Mad Frankie that did the torturing. And uh, he was on trial for this. It was the famous torture trial. yeah, In which it was uh, explained to the court the methods that were used by this lunatic, uh, he would, uh, listen, this is what they did, absolutely, I, I've seen the reports, yeah, he, uh, he got the, uh, the victims, and in the old warehouses, which had large wooden floors, he nailed them, or him and his gang nailed them to the floor, through each wrist or each hand, yeah, and through each ankle, yeah, and then, Frankie Fraser, mad Frankie Fraser, would set them on fire. Or, and probably also, 
extracting their teeth with a set of pliers that he got just ripping the teeth out. He didn't seem to think uh, this was particular. He's a psychopath, you see. And the nature of a psychopath is they have no empathy and can't. You don't look at them and think, oh, these poor people are hurting, you know. No, no, no. Hey, the more pain, the better. Out with the teeth, yeah. Also, he used to attach uh, wires to the victim's testicles and wire them up to a 12-volt battery so they'd be <clears throat> excruciatingly tortured by this. He, Frankie Fraser spent a total of 42 years of his life behind bars. And it was in the year 1980 that I met him. I'd read his record because I was the records officer. And uh, I was one day, one lunchtime, on duty, given duty to uh, work on A-Wing. If you go through strange ways, through the big gates, straight ahead, through the corridor, up to the top, into the rotunda, yeah, the first wing on your left is A-Wing, yeah, and that's where Mad Frankie Fraser was. And I was there at lunchtime one day as the officer in charge of A-Wing, which basically involved walking around the wing and ensuring that everybody was okay, you know, nobody was dangling from a rope. All that kind of stuff, you know. Just what generally happens in prison. And uh, as I was doing this, I saw Frankie Fraser walking along the landing. Now, I knew what he looked like because I'd seen the ugly bastard's photograph. And I, I, just, I said, Fraser, and I get behind your door and shut it. And he, and he said, uh, I'll go behind my door. But if you want it shut, you shut it. That's your job. Seriously, that's what he said to me. He was wearing slippers, by the way. Not shoes, slippers. Apparently, he'd convinced the doctors that he had uh, bad feet. Something about pour, somebody poured boiling water on them or something. And, and he couldn't walk properly. So he, he had this, he was excused boots, believe it or not. And he tried to tell me that the chief officer, the number one chief officer, had permitted him to remain with his cell open. He said, uh, he said yeah, I don't have to be locked up. So anyway, I locked him up. And I went to see the chief officer, the number one chief officer. And I said, well, what's this about? Uh, you, you allowing mad Frankie Fraser to be completely unlocked during uh, lunch hours. Everybody locked up, you know. Oh, he said, it's only Frankie, he's all right, you know. I said, no, he's not all right. He is insane. He has injured numerous staff. He incapacitated one officer at Durham Prison by smacking him at the back of the head with a metal chair right at the back of his head, fractured his optic nerve, and the man was blind. That's mad Frankie Fraser. And this number one chief officer... Seemed to think it was all right for him to be unlocked at dinner time. I mean, what happens if he'd come and done the same to me? Quite easily could have done. And this very same number one chief officer, he was giving him, taking him pork pies. Frankie Fraser liked pork pies. So not only did he excuse boots, and he had a single cell on A2 landing, which is a nice open landing there. Yeah, no open down the stairs for Frankie Fraser. And he was getting pork pies from the number one chief officer and giving cheek to me. When I told him to get behind his cell door, he gave me what I would call a very old-fashioned look. You know, one of them. Oh, really? You think so, do you? Well, I did think so. And that's the way I treated Frankie Fraser, just like I would any other inmate. Get behind your door. And uh, as for walking around unattended, you've got to be joking. If you want to see that uh, number one chief officer, have a look on YouTube. Strange Ways, 1979-1980, uh, it was a, by the BBC, a, 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 a documentary, and it's in the episode called Screws. That number one chief officer is sat down with the governor 
plotting a disciplinary charge against me. Now that number one chief officer was at the time a member of the Prison Officers Association. As I was. And there he is plotting with the governor on how to prosecute me. And they did do it. More of which in another of these brilliant episodes, Tales from the Jails. I hope you've enjoyed it. Do subscribe down here, if you will, and get my book, Psychic Screw. Thank you very much.